Hi there. Today we're going to talk to you about preparing your business for sale. My name is John Fife Miller and I'm someone who has both purchased and sold businesses over the past four decades. I've had great experience in selling businesses in a family scenario and selling businesses to a third party. One thing that we can guarantee you is selling your business is different with every individual you're going to deal with. And today we're going to talk to you about that. So first, let's talk about the key ingredient of selling your business. Whether you're going to pass it on to a family member, partners, employees, or you're going to sell it to a third party, the time you spend today will pay dividends when you go to close the deal. So let's ask the first question. The big question is why? There are many reasons why people want to sell their business and we're going to deal with a couple of them right off the bat. First off, risk. We all know as business owners that there's a certain amount of risk when we take on owning our business. But as our business grows, that risk also grows. And for some of us, especially when our business gets to a size that we find that risk can sometimes become more difficult for us to assess than we want to. That becomes a good time. Retirement, death or illness. We're all hearing right now that baby boomers are becoming to the retirement age. With that, we know that a lot of small businesses out there will be looking to transition their businesses to new leadership. Changes in lifestyle. For some of us, that could be as simple as our children are being born. For others, it could be that our parents are moving back in with us. But changes in lifestyle can definitely impact how we run our businesses. Time. We all think when we start a small business that it's going to give us the ability to find time to do other things. We quickly learn how much time our businesses take. And as a result, that time continues to grow. Where we're willing to put that time in to see our business grow, at some point in time, we want to reap the rewards of getting that time back. And selling our business will definitely do that. Money. There's two sides to money. One is your business could be running out of money. And if that's the case, that's an ideal time to look at selling. The other side is that your business could be cash heavy. And if your business is cash heavy, you may also look at it and say, this is an exit time for me to exit out of this business. Market changes. Market changes are one that are always coming along. But let's even look at those market changes post COVID and how things have changed drastically with our employees working from home, People require less materials at their office, and we're seeing huge market changes to better serve the business community. Feasibility. If you owned a uh, video store today, the feasibility of your video store being successful is probably remote. So the feasibility of your business moving forward can force you to look at selling. And one of the big things, and it's always important to recognize this from the day you open, Everything is always for sale. Should someone come along and offer you what you want, when you want, always remember that you've created something that is saleable at the end. When to sell. First, I'd like to say that we will always like to be able to sell our business when we can control it. And that doesn't always happen. But I think there's some strong points here that can be made. You always want to sell when you have strong economic growth in your business. The better your business is doing, the more value and the more money that it's actually worth. That could be securing new contracts and it could be closing on potential amalgamations with other businesses. But it's important to recognize that if you're looking for the time, you want to do it when your business is strong. Also, keep in mind it's when people are talking about your business. We all have the ability to take that goodwill that we put into a business and make that goodwill grow. But when people are talking about us, especially in the industry we are in, that is always a good time to look at selling. If we're looking at a specific time, one of the things that I will say to you is you always want to try and close at a fiscal year end. Your professionals will tell you this is an ideal time that will work for you. And I think you're going to find that from the grand scheme of how you want to deal with things, closing at your fiscal year end will work best. So let's talk about your buyer and what your buyer is looking for. Why do they want to buy your business instead of starting a new business? One, mentorship. 
You've worked in this business for years and they know they can get guidance from you. Cash flow and financing. Many of the businesses today that are being sold are being sold based on cash flow and or financing by the seller carrying that loan. It gives them an opportunity to use the business as leverage to move forward. Established name and reputation, that goodwill that you've created. That goodwill has value and that goodwill to them is something that they can move forward with. Existing staff. If you have great staff, many times they don't want to leave. So this gives them the ability to hit the ground running with a solid staff in place that understands the market that they're moving into. Existing market share. Your business has market share, no matter how big or how small. But in purchasing your business, I purchase that market share right away. As a new purchaser, it's my responsibility to hold on to that market share, but it gives me that opportunity to start. One and done. One of the things that's great about buying a business from someone is you are buying everything, you are not buying some things. And in buying everything, it makes that easy shopping experience for me. I no longer have to spend hours out at different locations trying to purchase different things. I'm getting everything all at once. And the last piece, which you'll hear us talk further about down the road, is a family business. The reality is with family businesses, you want to hold on to the legacy of that business. So your potential purchasers are looking to do just that. But there's always some pros and cons to selling, and let's look at those and see what they are. The pros, if you're losing money, you can cut your losses, and that's something that you probably want to look at doing. It gives you the opportunity to free up time and cash for other ventures. In many instances, long-term business owners become bored, and they are looking to do something else. And when you're looking to do something else, you need that cash and you need that time to do it. As we talked about earlier, if there are profits in the business, you can lock those profits in. Those are yours to move forward. It can relieve stress and anxiety. Now, I know when we thought when we moved into our small business that there would be some stress and anxiety, we quickly learned when we got there what that actually means. And again, as our business grows, so does that stress and anxiety level. It allows us to remove that, which from a health perspective is fabulous. The last thing is it can safeguard your employees and team. Again, these have been your colleagues for a long period of time. You want them to succeed. And in wanting them to succeed, this gives them the opportunity to remain in that atmosphere that they've gelled in. Some of the cons. You're going to lose a potential revenue stream. This has paid you a wage, and it's paid you a wage possibly for a long time. But in selling this business, that wage and that revenue stream is going to go away. The emotional ties that you have with your business. Make no mistake, when you do this, it is going to leave a hole in you. And it is really hard for some people to adjust to that new life without something that they have spent so much time in. You lose conductivity to the people that you know. That could be staff, that could be competitors, that's definitely clients, and could even be service and sales staff. The reality is you've developed a life around these people, and in selling this business, a lot of these people will weed away from your circle of friends. It takes longer than you think. I know when we decide that we want to sell our business, we would like it done in a month. But the chances are we're not talking months. We probably are talking year plus. So understand going in that this is not something that's going to happen immediately. That's why you want to make these decisions early on. And last, you give up control. Again, hard. I worked at my business for over 40 years. 10 years ago, I amalgamated with another business. I had to give up some of that control. And it's very challenging to do. You adapt to it, but it is something that you're going to find will be a challenge as you move forward. So when do we start the process? For owners, I would always suggest to you, you start two to four years ahead of time because you have to be prepared. And when we look at that two to four year cycle, I'm not saying two to four years from the day the sign goes up on your door that says your business is up for sale. Two to four years to get prepared to put that sign on your door that says your business is up for sale. For purchasers, 12 months ahead of time. 
And remember, purchases are always open. They're always looking for a deal. So they will come to you ready. So you have to be ready for them. Now, there are many different structures to how we can put this sale together. And one of the things we want to talk about is the different structures we have in business and how those structures will affect the sale. First, let's talk about sole proprietorships, a company that's owned by one individual. First, I'm going to tell you primarily you're going to be selling assets off. You're going to be selling equipment and inventory, customer lists, staff, goodwill. There are no shares involved in this sale. It is only the business. Usually this tends to be a straight buyout, but one important thing to remember is this can include multiple buyers. You may have someone who wants to buy your equipment and someone else who only wants to buy your customer list. The next item, partnerships. Now partnerships deal a lot in the same realm as sole proprietorship, but it does add one interesting caveat, and that is you have a partner. Partners usually have the right of first refusal on sales. So what does that mean? I want to stress that when you have a partner, you should always have a partnership agreement in place. It will make some of these decisions so much easier. If the partner doesn't want to buy all of your stake in the business, only a part, they usually want to have the ability to have a controlling interest. And you can design that however you want it to be. Partners usually always have to agree to a third party. And that can be a third party, that could be a sibling. But partners usually have to agree to that sale. One of the things that we have always done is in our partnerships, we always valued our business on an annual basis. And the main reason for doing that is not based on if we were selling to a third party, but it was always based on if we were selling to one another. We felt that if we valued it on an annual basis, when it came time for sale, we had already agreed on the price, which makes life a lot easier and a lot quicker going into that sale. Corporations. So the province of Ontario looks at corporations as an entity unto themselves. So you're not selling a business, you are selling an actual entity under the guise of the province. Shares are always involved. It can be a share sale, or it can be an asset sale. You can sell one or the other. It may involve partners with buy-sell agreements that are in place, and we talked about that earlier. One of the things with a corporation is there are multiple options for buyouts. That could be a buyout where the company is funding it. It could be a buyout where the seller is funding it. Normally, in a corporation, you are going to require a valuation of your business from a third party. And this is easy from a seller perspective. One of the great things about selling a corporation and selling your shares is it is a one-stop deal. They are buying everything that you own, which is fabulous. The next one we put in here is cooperatives. Cooperatives are interesting. They're not unlike partnerships. The challenge being cooperatives have many partners. Now, the reason that we put this here is because today, there are many cooperatives that are coming. Here in London, we have the London Brew Cooperative, which is one organization, but an organization with many partners. So when you look at that, one of the things that you have to understand is that when you go to sell, you have to appease your partnership. So you are trying to get your membership to agree. So while you have an immediate pool of purchasers, at the same point in time, you need agreement from a larger group of people. One of the great things about a cooperative though, if your goal is to walk away from your business, you have many people there who can take over that role. The last thing I wanna talk about there is noting that when you get into cooperatives, there are many members who are not knowledgeable with the day-to-day -day operations. And you have to keep that in mind that those people will still have a say in that sale. You've heard me talk about asset sales and share sales. And I want to talk about both of those a little bit more in depth. First as an asset sale. So some of the pros of an asset sale, you can sell items individually, which can be much more lucrative. 
So you can look at the assets you have and sell your equipment and sell your customer list separately. And in some ways, that becomes a better way to increase your revenue. You avoid any shareholder issues. You get to depreciate goodwill over time. The transaction can be quicker. And as you sell items off, the business can still to continue to function to generate income for you. The cons, you have to deal with multiple parties here. So it takes a lot more time to do this sort of sale. There is no guarantee on an asset and you don't want to guarantee any of those assets. Unpurchased assets go for scrap. Inevitably, when you're selling assets in a sale, you will have residual leftovers. And when you have those, chances are you're just going to dispose of them. So the value becomes next to nothing. There's additional paperwork to take over existing contracts. When you look at an asset sale, anything that is leased or anything that has licenses will have to be renegotiated with those owners. As an example, in our company, we leased all of our copiers. If we sold our business and wanted to take over those leases, we would have to go through the process again with those companies to get those leases in place in our name, which costs money and which takes time. And there are always taxes associated with this transfer. Now let's look at a share sale. So again, a share sale is through a corporation, but you are buying an entity. The pros, this is a one-stop shop for everything. You are selling the whole business to someone. Because of that, there are no title changes. Those title changes on licenses and such stay within the company that you're purchasing. Licenses do not need sales approval, and it is simpler than an asset sale. Why? Because you're doing one piece that you're selling. And the business you built will survive under new ownership. So that legacy that you're looking for will tend to stay intact. The cons, of course, you cannot handpick assets. Liabilities are transferred. And this is an interesting piece. Always remember when you do a share sale, you're buying the good, but you are also purchasing the bad. Any liabilities are transferred with those shares. Goodwill is not tax deductible and not a write-off. So goodwill will be written off over time, but is not tax deductible. More often than not, you are holding the loan on this. You are going to be the person who is financing this deal. And of course, securities laws apply to this sale. So once we have our head around the fact that we want to sell our business, who do we need to make it successful? First off, we need an accountant. We need someone there who is going to do the financial viability. Our lawyer, our banker, we need to tell our banker that this is our plan at the end of the day, that our goal is to sell our business. Our family, there's no point in keeping from your family that you're looking to sell your business. You need them there supporting you at the end of the day. So make sure they understand why. For some of us, we'll use a business broker. Many of us know our business is really well and it's not a step that we have to take, but it could be something that would assist you if you need to reach a broader region. The last thing here that I think is important is a support team, and that's friends and colleagues. Make sure you have people around you who are your support team through this process. This is not easy. This is a hard thing to go through. It will be emotionally draining for you and you need that support team to ensure that they're there to give you the help you need to get you through this trying time. Now let's talk about the technical things that we need to make this successful. Accurate financials. A lot of people will tell you you need three years. I'm going to tell you post COVID you need five. And that's because many businesses were affected deeply by COVID. That could be in a negative or a positive way. I know someone who owns a small bike shop and COVID was very lucrative for them. But for most of us, COVID was very trying financially. So because of that, I would suggest five years. On the accurate financials, you may break them down very specifically in how you do it. 
I would suggest that you come up with, with a simple set of financials that you feel comfortable to share out with people that give an overarching view of your business. Tax returns, same thing. Minimum three years, I would say right now, minimum five years. A list of all your fixtures and equipment is a must. Copies of any mortgage or lease on your property is definite. As a buyer, I want to know how long I'm locked into this property and what the goal is. Copies of equipment leases and rentals, and we talked about that earlier. We need to know what has ongoing impact on the value of this business. The value of our inventory, an employee list, and definitely a customer list. And I'm going to tell you on that customer list, you want there to be as much information on that list as possible because that will benefit the seller. And the more information that's on that list, the more the buyer will pay for your business. Now, of course, the biggest question of all, valuation of what we own. The one thing I am going to tell you, and as someone who sold three businesses, we always think our business is worth more than it actually is. A good rule of thumb, your business is going to be worth what someone will pay you for it in the end of the day. And it's very important that we don't take that insultingly. This is a business deal. So part of it is negotiation. But I want to talk about four individual methods that we can use to value our business. One is a return on investment. We all know what our ROI is. I would suggest again, you use a five-year plan, take a look at your return, and then you will have an industry standard of three, four, or five times that ROI for a value. Sales of comparable businesses. In some instances, this is very easy. If I own a restaurant, I can look and see what other restaurants are selling for. In other businesses, it's much more difficult. In my case, I owned a printing company. Very difficult to find a comparable business for what I owned to sell it. Industry formulas. I will tell you every industry will have a formula in how to sell their business. But you have to be careful with those because a lot of those formulas are driven through US statistics, not Canadian statistics. And last is an asset approach. Basically looking at what you own and what do you have and putting a value to it at the end of the day. What I will tell you is there is no correct way, but you need to pick one that works for you and you need to use that one on a consistent basis. Again, a valuable hint and we talked about it earlier. I would value your business on an annual basis because it's a great starting point for you in understanding what your business is actually worth. Now we want to talk about some purchaser options and those strengths and weaknesses. We said earlier, different purchases will desire different structures and at times different professionals. As we said, there's no right answer. What you need to do is what's best for you. One of the things I want to point out though is you will need to engage with the appropriate professionals to get the most up-to-date advice when you're using this. So make sure that your lawyer and your accountant are with you as you go through this process. So let's focus in on some options. First is an easy one, and that's a share sale. Again, as we talked about, with a share sale, you are purchasing an entity. This is going to benefit the seller from a time perspective. In other words, you are dealing with one buyer that's making your life easier. It tends to have a lower sell point because I'm buying everything, not pieces of things. It removes the existing responsibilities and liabilities from you. Any responsibilities and liabilities that go with your business are going with those shares when they move on. And lastly, the past and future liabilities, as we talked about, rest with the purchaser. The second type we want to talk about is a buyout. And that buyout basically is talking about an extended period of time where someone will buy your business. You could be financing that or they could be financing that through the bank. This tends to benefit the purchaser. So therefore you can get a higher sell point. One of the great things about the sell point is if you're holding this loan, you can make interest on it, which is fabulous. It does control you a little bit for getting the money up front, but if you're looking for that consistent income, you're going to get that from this. One of the things I would suggest to you is if your purchaser defaults, you should get the business back and that's important and that should be written into your agreement. 
This can be a share sale or an asset sale. And one thing that's important, always get a deposit up front. That buyout is not unlike buying a home. I want something up front to know that you're committed. A cash sale tends to benefit both parties. Again, a lower sell point because cash is being transacted at the end of the deal. A cash sale is your best option to walk away from your business on closing. There is little to no say in the future of your business though, and that's important. Once that cash sale is completed, you in essence are done. And this is usually an asset sale. An employee share ownership plan. Now these tend to be a little bit new in Canada. They have been used a lot in the US over previous years, but the employee share ownership basically is an agreement between the ownership and the, the employees to purchase the business. This benefits the purchaser. It does have a higher sell point, And again, you usually will be the individual holding that loan. That purchase is usually based on an agreed timeline through company profits, which you will have through the history. Usually can be a share sale. If it's a small company, it can be an asset sale. One of the great things about this though, especially for your customers, it will ensure continuity. On the closing of this sale the next day, your customers are dealing with the same team that they dealt with the day before. Amalgamation. I did one of these in 2009. I will tell you an amalgamation usually, if not always, happens with a competitor. It tends to be a lower sell point because you are selling to a competitor. You can ask for a buyout. You may get it, you may not. But I think asking for a buyout is important. And the reason that I think that's important is for you in this role, you want to exit fairly quickly. Why? Because there's a reason this person was a competitor to you. They will make decisions that are different than the decisions you will make, and it will be emotionally draining for you. So your plan on an amalgamation, if you are not planning to stay within the business and have a role where you can make decisions, I would suggest you get out as quickly as you can. And usually this tends to be an asset sale. More often than not, they are buying your customer list. And the last resort is an auction or real estate sale. And this tends to be a last resort. Why? Because you're gonna get pennies on the dollar. This tends to happen through an asset sale when there are assets left and the business is no longer functioning. It's a quick and easy thing to do, but the one thing I would always stress to you at an auction, do not attend. An auction will give you a struggle to move forward because you will look at what you're getting on the dollar for the assets that you purchased over time. I've been to some where there were assets that were worth thousands of dollars that were sold in some cases for tens of dollars. It can be draining, it can be hard, it can be frustrating, so my suggestion is stay away. But now that we've gone through all that, I think what we need to do is we need to get the ball rolling. So who can we get on board? So, and I'm gonna say, before this makes front page headlines, which is an old school statement, or it gets posted on social media, who do you as the seller need to get personal with? First, your family. Your family needs to know what's going on. Secondly, your staff. You don't want your staff finding out from a third party that your business is up for sale. You want to explain to them what, why, and how, and get them on board. Your customers, yes, but I'm gonna talk about your major customers. Your major customers are going to hear this from your competitors. So make sure they are aware of why you're selling and what your plans are. We've talked a lot about our hired professionals. We need to ensure that they are on board. And lastly, your bank. Again, you don't want your bank finding out from someone else that your business is up for sale. Make sure they're aware. I'm a big believer in that communication is king when you're doing anything, but really important when you're selling. And one of those is word of mouth. And I'm a big believer that word of mouth is a way to excite potential purchasers. And that word of mouth can come from family members, partners, employees, competitors, investors, third-party purchasers. That list can go on, but make no mistake that the more people you tell that you're excited about selling your business, they will tell other people. 
And the more people that know, the more chance you have of selling that company. One of the things we talked about at the beginning is this takes time. In that time period, what are you going to do? I think first and foremost, you need to make sure your business is presentable. There are going to be a lot of purchasers that come through your physical building. And when they do, a presentable building actually will make you more money. You look organized, you're perceived as organized, and that will generate dollars for you. The second thing is you want to keep doing what you've been doing all along. This is still your business. You're still running this business and you should be running it the same way that you've been running it to this point. I would challenge you to entertain and vet every potential candidate. Sometimes we get to a point where we are only interested in vetting specific candidates, but I'm going to tell you vet everyone that comes through. And doing that entertaining and vetting doesn't just mean you sharing information with them, but you need to ensure they're sharing information with you. You want to know whether these companies are potentially viable to be able not just to buy your business, but if you have a buyout clause that they can pay you out. Keep everything up to date, your financials, your licenses, your service agreements, anything that you would normally do, you need to do. Don't leave these things for someone else to come in because when they take your business over, you want them to hit the ground running. Continue to actively grow your customer base. I think that's really important because if this doesn't go through, if this sale doesn't go through, you want to still have a viable business as you move forward. Don't change your strategy. If you have a winning strategy right now, I think it's important that you stay there. I'm not a big lover in a football game of a fourth quarter prevent defense, especially if the team that I'm playing against has only scored nine points. I think you continue with the strategy that you're moving with that's made you and given you the success that you've got to that point. So really what it comes to is you've owned this business for a while, so continue to make this business work. One thing I will caution you on though is you need to be keenly aware of staff and team member morale. Once you tell them that your business is up for sale, they can see an end in sight. You need to ensure that they stay positive. You need to constantly reinforce that this sale, this process is good for them and why. So if you see that morale is starting to drop, I would challenge you to bring your staff together and ensure that they see this for the win that you see it for. So through all of that, let's say congratulations. Let's say you get an offer. What are your next steps? The first item here I think is very important. Your sales agreement should contain everything. And I mean everything. There is nothing that you should have talked about at a lunch, on the phone, in an email, that shouldn't be in this document. You cannot, and there is no reason for you to assume that because you talked about something, it will be done. Make sure it gets written down and is in this agreement. I'm gonna tell you a hard thing to do is to second guess your decision. Always remember, your goal here from the start was to sell your business. Because from the time your offer comes in to the closing, you have some time in there, we always tend to second guess. Don't do that. You've got what you wanted. Next, continue to run your business until it's completed. That's key. Whether it be six months or a year, ensure that your business continues to move the way that you want it to do. Don't let anything slide. It is important that you don't leave things for the next person. Again, you want them to be successful, so let's keep everything up to date. One of the things, and I can tell you this from this July when I sold my shares, you need to find yourself a hobby because if you don't, somebody else will find a hobby for you. And I say that jokingly, but I do think it's really important. You will have a lot of time on your hands when your business sells. So ensure that you find something that you enjoy to fill that time. Hold the purchaser to the sales agreement that you have in place. When you look at who is going to buy your business, be it a family member, a colleague, a partner, a third party, this is a business deal. You have a sales agreement for a reason and holding the purchaser to that sales agreement is key. If you let things slide, inevitably, this is a deal that will start to go downhill. 
So if there are dates and there are commitments in that agreement, you need to ensure that that purchaser is meeting those deadlines. Meet with your professionals and get all of your tax planning in place. This will have tax implications on you. I don't want to speak to what those tax implications are, but you want to ensure that your professionals are on board so they can help you with that. And last but not least, celebrate this. This is what you wanted. So make sure you take some time. Some final takeaways from today, start sooner rather than later. Get your records in order and keep them in order. Always maintain and demand confidentiality. And what I mean by that is it is important we will be sharing a lot of information with potential buyers, a lot of private information. We need to know that they're going to be confidential. And one of the ways to get that is to always ensure that we are ones that create a high level of confidentiality for them. Don't mentally check out too early. One thing is we know one size does not fit all. So be open to options. Ensure your staff, partners, customers are all kept in the loop of what's going on. Get the price right and celebrate your success. A few items to try to avoid through the process, being too rigid. This needs to be a flexible process at the end of the way. There are so many ways that a deal can be structured. So be open to what some of those deals are. There's no need for guesswork through this. You have the information you need to make this successful. So don't guess. Not leveraging your professional services team. Yes, you are going to get a bill from your accountant. Yes, you are going to get a bill from your lawyer, but you need to bring them in at the beginning so that they are up to date on all of the information that's going on. Changing your mind or allowing someone to change it for you. It's hard to do, but again, you've got what you wanted. Your idea was to sell this business and you've done that. So stay true to that. And if you do, you will walk the path that you intended to in the first place. Pricing your business too high, which is something we all do. We know that it's hard, but in the end, what you need to do is understand that your business is going to be worth what someone is willing to pay you for it. Try not to make this personal. Many businesses sell to somebody that we know, and I understand why this happens and it becomes very easy to get personal, but I stress again, this is a business decision. Keep it business. The personal aspect of this can come after the sale is done, but understand and never lose sight of the fact that this is a business transaction. And again, don't lose sight of that bigger picture and that bigger picture is selling your business. I wanna talk for a minute about some things that we really can't control. We know COVID has thrown a wrench into many plans on moving forward. It's done a lot to our financials and how we look at them. So we have to be careful knowing how we go through that, especially when we're looking at some of our information. Government subsidies. Government subsidies were great in 2020 and 2021. But as we move into later years, government subsidies for businesses now can become a little bit of an anchor as payables start to come back in. So again, those are something that we have to keep in line. Inflation and interest rates continue to be high. And you know what? While that puts pressure on, let's never lose sight of the fact that right now interest rates are at about 4%. Interest rates at 4% probably are pretty close to the norm, not the 1% or 2% that we used to see. Accept the fact that we probably are coming back to somewhere of a normality that we've seen in the past. And the last thing is supply chain, which has been impacting everyone, and it will continue to do so. But in the end, I want to tell you that what you need to do is what's best for you and what's best for your family. Thank you very much. This has been Preparing Your Business for Sale. Again, my name is John Fife Miller, and my contact information is there should you have any questions. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.